Well, you may be wondering why I'm wearing my safari hat this morning. It's because I'm hog wild about in the wild, the great experiences and encounters with Jesus. That's our VBS motto. It's coming up soon. June 23rd through 26th. I hope you're fired up. Are y'all, are y'all fired up about VBS? Let me hear you. Come on. Well, I've been wearing my hat for a couple of weeks, so much so that Holly has already warned me if I don't get the thing off, I'm going to be sleeping in a while. <laughs> that, that was a joke. That was a joke. No, in all seriousness, statistics show, and this is Alabama Baptist statistics, all the children, that, out of all the children that come to Bible school, nearly 20% of them are from unchurched families. That's one in five. So that's pretty serious. And here's the exciting news, and this is why I'm pumped up, is because we get an opportunity as a church to, to witness to these kids when they come here, you know, and, and make an impact for Christ in their lives. So I hope that you're pumped up, and you're prayed up, and that you're ready to get involved with VBS. There are places to plug in, so please be a part of VBS. All right, just a few logistical announcements here from Miss Sherry. First off, if you're a team member, if you are already signed up, okay, and you need supplies, please get those requests to her by June the 12th. So that's coming up soon. All right, the second thing is, as far as decorating your rooms, all right, we want to do that the weekend before, or the weekend of VBS, excuse me. So like the 21st and 22nd, and then that Sunday, the 23rd. Now, if you start decorating before Sunday morning, be sure that you leave room for the Sunday school class that will be meeting in there that Sunday morning. Then you can come in Sunday afternoon and get everything in its final final place. All right. If you're on the snack team, please uh, touch base with Miss Janet Williams as soon as possible to confirm any, any kind of arrangements or schedules that you'll need to be doing uh, as far as the snacks go. And then the last thing is... The team, all the team members will be meeting on the Sunday afternoon, June 23rd at 3.15 to get our final instructions from Miss Sherry before we have our big kickoff with all the kids here. So June 23rd, 3.15. Hey, let's get fired up about some VBS. Come on. You know, I told the first service that so many times people are around my kids and they say, oh, Holly, your kids are so much like you. But now y'all got a little taste of the Alex that we experience at home. And so now I think you realize that my kids are more like their dad than, than you ever thought. We're so glad to have you here this morning. Will you please stand and sing with us? If you've been walking the same old road for miles and miles, been hearing the same old voice tell the same old lies If you're trying to fill the same old holes inside There's a better life There's a better life If you've got pain He's a pain taker If you feel lost He's a way maker Savior, if you've got chains, he's a chain breaker. We've all searched for the light of day in the dead of night. We've all found ourselves worn out from the same old fight. We've all run to things we know just stay right. When there's a better life. Receive it 
If you can feel it, somebody testify. Sing it again. If you believe it, if you receive it, if you can feel it, somebody testify, testify. If you believe it, if you receive it, if you can feel it, somebody testify. that you are that chain breaker. Father, I pray that whatever people in this service, whatever they have going on in their lives, Father, I pray that they will give that to you, that if they feel that they are bound by chains, help us all to realize that you can break those chains. We can leave a completely different person than what we came in. We can feel completely different. We can leave with your peace, God. So I just pray for every person here, Father. Please help us all just to be open. Help us to be listening listening with our ears, with our minds, with our hearts, Father, to whatever you would have to say through to us, whether it's through the music, through the words, whether it's through um, Brother Martin as he brings the message, Father, I pray that we'll all be obedient to whatever you are leading us to do. And God, thank you so much for Vacation Bible School. We're all getting ready, God. I pray that people, if they've been on the fence on participating, that they will decide, yes, I will participate. And I know they'll get such a blessing from it, God. We want to be your hands and your feet. And we want to reach out to the children in our community, God. And by reaching out to the kids, we're going to reach out to so many parents and families. So help that just to always be on our minds. Dear God, we thank you for this opportunity that you've given each of us to come into this place and worship you, to learn more about you and enjoy sweet fellowship. Please, Father, will you bless this offering? Will you multiply it and use it as only you can? Please be with Sherry as she leads Children's Church. Please be with Brother Martin as he brings the message. What a powerful word he has for us, God. We love you. In your name pray. Amen. You may be seated. Oh, shame is a prison as cruel as a grave. And shame is a robber and he's come to take my name. Oh, love is my redeemer, lifting me up from the ground. Love is the power when my freedom song is found. Shame is a prison.
Please greet those around you.
If you are following along in our bulletin, and if you're like me, you kind of check, see, what are we going to sing this Sunday? We are going to skip a song for today. And I know it's a song, oh, I love this song, Who You Say I Am. It's a powerful song. We will do it more. But Brother Martin's message is so powerful. If you were here on Sunday night, you got a taste of it. And I don't want him to be short on time at all. So we're going to take out that song, give him all the time um, that he can have, and we're going to jump into rescue. So if you'll please stand and sing this with us.
gave everything for us. And so, Father, this morning, I pray that you make us mindful that, God, you are always fighting for us. You are constantly striving to, to be our shelter, to be our comfort, to be our God. And so, Father, we just pray this morning that as we continue to worship you, God, that you would just help us to enter this time with an attitude of thanksgiving and gratefulness for the price that you paid and the extreme measures that you went to just for us to have a relationship with you. God, help us not to approach it flippantly or half-heartedly, but God, to realize the cost that it cost you and the reflection of the love that that means you have for each of us. Change our hearts, God, and, and help us just to live each day from a moment of thanks and praise to who you are. God, we love you so much and just thank you for all that you do for us. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, last Sunday afternoon, I found myself in some trouble. And uh, I had gotten a call on Friday to ask if I could help with a funeral. And the funeral wasn't until 5 o'clock in the afternoon. And I didn't know how to cover the evening service. And it so happened I had a meeting with David on Saturday morning. And when he walked in, I just asked him, would he fill in for me on Sunday night? And he said yes. Uh, and then Sunday night after church, I began getting all kind of notifications uh, that David had just done an outstanding job. And one of the notifications said, you know, more than just a Sunday night crowd needs to hear what David said. So I called David and asked, could he fill in for me this morning? And he graciously said that he would. I want you to welcome David as he comes this morning to share with us.
how about the mute button? I'm on? Y'all hear me? Woohoo! All right, we're cooking now. <clears throat> what I basically want to share with you is a testimony um, of how in the last 14 months, God has brought me to a place um, that I'm able to stand again. Uh, I've been a pastor 40, 49 years, and um, the Lord uh, decided the time was for him to take my wife to be with him January a year ago. And since that time, it's been very difficult for me to stand in front of a crowd. And so when Kevin asked me the other night, <clears throat> or the uh, other Saturday a week ago, my first inclination before I even answered was to, I'm not ready. <clears throat> and then I got a prompting in my heart from the Holy Spirit that said, yes, you are. Uh, you, need to, you need to share your story. And uh, I had already written down several things, making notes of my journey. And um, so I shared it last Sunday night, and that, that's what I'm going to do today, share that with you. But um, you're going to find, some of you, unlike, uh, you probably are like me in the sense that you're going through a journey. And I believe that. You're going to hear that in a few moments, that um, if you're a Christian, then you're on a path that God has planned for you. Uh, you can deviate from that path, and you can suffer the consequences. You can be obedient to that path, and you can enjoy the dividends, the blessings of God's blessing on your life. And I've done both. And um, so as, uh, before I get into the testimony, uh, there's a short passage of Scripture that I want to share with you that I think that if you are a Christian, you certainly will identify with. <clears throat> because God used it in my life many, many years ago and just reminded me in my quiet time yesterday of this passage. It's in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. Listen carefully. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of the world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air. Stop. Can you identify with that? Come on, give me a nod or something. You were dead in your transgressions and your sins. You were following the ruler of this world. The spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sin sinful nature, following its desires and its thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath. But something happened. It happened to me at the age of 17. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace that you have been saved. Can somebody say amen to that? Father, what a pleasure it is to stand and to testify of your wonderful grace <clears throat> and your mercy. Undeserving as we are, we're here today. Probably most in this room have experienced that. Maybe some have not. And perhaps those that have not will understand that you've drawn them to this place at this very moment in time in history, that they can have an opportunity to respond to you. And so, Lord, would you take the thoughts now that I sense that you've given me and uh, would you apply them in a way that would change our lives, that our faith would grow, our confidence in you, our sense of security in you, and our purpose for the rest of our lives? I ask you to do that, Father, because you're the only one that can do it. I, I'm just a mouthpiece. I can't change anyone, and I realize that. So I'm asking you to do what only you can do. And I trust you to do that, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> there was a young preacher in the last century by the name of Charles Spurgeon. Some of you probably heard of Charles Spurgeon, have you not? A great, gifted man. He wrote this as a young man in 1855 at his church in London. He said, 
would you lose your sorrows? Would you drown your cares? Then go, plunge yourself into the Godhead's deepest sea. Be lost in his immensity, and you shall come forth as from the couch of rest, refreshed and invigorated. I know nothing which can so comfort the soul, so calm the swelling billows of grief and sorrow, so spark, so speak to the winds of trial as a devout musing upon the Godhead. Last year, it was January It was 2.30 in the afternoon. Prior to that January, I was in my church office. And I got a phone call from my wife. She said, sweetheart, I'm in the Walmart parking lot and I don't know what's wrong. But I'm afraid to drive home. I immediately told my secretary, I'm going to see what's wrong with Barbie. I came to the parking lot. I took her and my vehicle, brought her home, had our car picked up. And from that point on, she began to experience anxiety, depression. We didn't know what was wrong. Barbie's been healthy all of her life. And uh, we both have been blessed with good health. And after a lot of tests, MRIs, CAT scans, heart tests, everything, we got to the place to where they, they said, well, she has mild Parkinson's disease. I thought, we can deal with that. Her condition continued to worsen and get worse and worse. And finally, she was having problems standing and problems walking. And, and uh, one time, I was in the living room, and she called me, and she said, she called me out loud in the bedroom and she was lying in a fetal position on the bed. And she said, sweetheart, I think I'm dying. I grabbed her up and threw her in the car and ran to the, we ran to the hospital in Fort Payne, the ER, and they couldn't find anything. Long story short, um, it began to plunge me into an area that I'd never traveled before. And last January, at 2.30 in the afternoon on a Saturday, she was lying in my arms. And during her illness, we had gone to Vanderbilt in Nashville, and the doctors told us she had Lewy body dementia. And I had kept meticulous records of everything we had done, every test. And I took them with me. And the doctors had a team in Vanderbilt. Uh, you can't find this team everywhere. They don't even have them in the University of Alabama at that time. And they said to me, Mr. Martin, it looks like your wife has what we think is Lewy body dementia. Do you remember Robin Williams, the actor? He had just taken his life by suicide the year before. And he was diagnosed with, mild, with Parkinson's. But his autopsy revealed that he had Lewy body dementia, which his wife posted on the Mayo Clinic website. My daughter downloaded that. And when we saw all of those symptoms, we said, hmm, this could be. We ended up at Vanderbilt. And he said, Mr. Martin, there are two tracks for this. There's a fast track and a slow track. And it seems like your wife is on the fast track. He didn't tell me everything to expect. We went home, and I had my daughter with me up there to help me listen to everything he said. And uh, I had time to sit down and start assessing everything. And the fast track meant maybe a year, somewhere like along that line. And I went to the Lord, and I said, um, Just give me a minute. 
I said, Lord, <clears throat> we've been together a long time. You and I, Lord. And uh, I know you do all things well. If this could be, I want you to heal her. But if you choose not to do that, one thing I want you to do. Lord, would you do this for me? Would you help her to remember me and the children as she goes through this illness? That's all. <laughs> the Saturday she died. We were in my, we were at home and she was in my arms. My children were there. I kissed her and she called. She called my children by their nickname. So, <clears throat> the road to this place where I am now I'm, has been a road of triumph, of tragedy, and a whole lot of faith. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, I, I was born back over here about six miles behind Old Sardis Church down from Northeast College in uh, 1945. I know you're probably saying, he's old as dirt. How's he standing up there? He's an old man. Back in that day, um, when I went in the Army uh, in 1965, you know, you had to fill out a form where your place of birth and uh, they had a place hospital. I wasn't born in a hospital. That was so funny. The guys got a big kick out of that. I said, I wasn't. They said, what? You weren't born in a hospital? I said, no. My mother told me the doctor came out in a buggy and delivered me. Now I'm really old, aren't I? You're wondering how I'm even standing here. But that's where I was born. And there's a little block building. If you go to Powell Cross Roads on the right there, that used to be an elementary school. Uh, Gary Don Kirk and I were in school together there, first and second grade, 1952. My parents moved from here. They were very poor. Like a lot of folks back in the 50s, they had no money. My dad went to Chattanooga to get a job in uh, a foundry up there. Later on, everybody in the south here was finding jobs up in the automobile industry in Detroit and Illinois. We ended up moving to Illinois in a little community outside South Chicago. And uh, we were just hillbillies. That's what they called us back then. You guys ever hear that word? Huh? Hillbillies? Well, I was a hillbilly in, 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 in Illinois. And um, it, was, it, was, it, was quite, it was quite an experience, believe me. I told the morning group that um, I was just a good little country boy. And my mother took me in school, and I was enrolled in the elementary school there. <clears throat> and at that time, they didn't like Southerners because all the Southern people were coming up there taking a lot of jobs. And so we were looked upon as, ooh, you know. And so for me, after school every day, we had to walk. We didn't have a school bus. We walked in the snow when it was this deep. The snow, you know, I laugh about that. We get a snow around here, everybody shuts down. They go buy all the bread out of the stores. When we get a little snow... Well, back then, it could, be, it could be knee deep. You just got out and went on. They plowed the snow, and I walked to school every day and walked home. But every day, just about it, for the first, oh, several, six months or so, I was in a fist fight because I was a Southerner. Those Yankees, they knew how to fight. But I'm going to tell you what, they never run into a little wiry hillbilly either. And I gave it back just like I got it. And after winning a few fights, I won their friendship, and I began to... Uh, appreciate the Polish boys, 
the Italian boys, the black boys, and not knowing that God was preparing me for a lifetime of ministry in which he would lead me to pastor and minister to different cultures all over the place. You see, this was the plan. I want you to listen carefully. God loves you so much. Even as a youngster, he will try to hem you in. And every experience you have in life, God wants to use that. You listen carefully? He doesn't waste any heartaches. He doesn't waste the pain. He never wasted those fist fights. He never wasted the times that I sat with my buddies in their home as an Italian and saw their Italian mothers throw the food all over the table and we just dug in. He didn't waste any of that. But during that time, it wasn't too long after that that my parents divorced. And I had two sisters. I'm the oldest of three. And uh, when the divorce took place, my father brought me with him back here to Alabama my mother and two sisters remained up there. And during the time here in Alabama, my dad remarried. And uh, that was quite a challenge because at that point in time, and this changed, my stepmother did not accept me. And you need to see that uh, I, was a, I was a very confused teenager at that time. I was discouraged. I was lonely. I had no direction in life. And believe me, Satan would have loved, and he did pretty good for a while, to try and destroy me. And there I was. My dad ended up going to South Florida because he had relatives that worked down there in Palm Beach County. And all of a sudden, things began to change. While I was in South Florida, um, have you all know what a blind date is? Huh? I see a few of you nodding your head. Some of you have no clue what I'm talking about. That means that uh, somebody sets you up with a boyfriend, a boy or a girl. You've never met them. You've never seen them. You've never talked to them. And you agreed to go out on a date with them. Huh? You're nodding your head. You know what I'm talking about? I figured you did. So my buddy said, I'm going to fix you up on a blind date, David. You, are you up for that? I said, you bet I am, man. Yeah, let's go. He fixed me up on that blind date, and he said, uh, the girl's name that I want you to go out with, or that I'm going to set you up with, her name is Barbie. Now, the name sounded cute. Come Friday, time to go get the girlfriend. He called me again and said, David, I've got another surprise. Barbie called earlier and couldn't go, and I, so I set you up with another girl that we're going to go pick up. But then, just a little while ago, Barbie called and said, she'll go with you. I said, well, what's the problem? <laughs> I said, let's take them both. And we did. <laughs> now, you've got to understand, and I won't go into a lot of stuff here about back in my day, if you had a hot car, you could get the girls. And I had the cream of the crop in cars at that time, a 55 Chevrolet two-door hardtop Bel Air that I took the engine to a speed shop, had it done over. And I mean, it was not only cool, but it was fast. And my, my cousin, Gene Wright, he, he appreciates this story so much because he's still into that stuff. But I was blowing the doors off of everything in that town. So on the blind date, I had the car, and I had two girlfriends, or two girls. So we go and pick up the first girl. Her name is Sandy. And she was not such a good looker, you know? I thought, mm, a blind date? I don't know if I want to do that again. And then he said, we're going to go pick up Barbie. I said, I hope this is a little better. Well, there she is. Woo-wee, look at that. That's my 55 Chevy, by the way. She kept that car while I went off into the army and drove it to high school and said she never did drag race anybody, but I didn't believe her. And so we get to the drive-in that night. I pick, we picked Barbie up, and I said, man, look at this gal. She sits on the right side next to the passenger's door. Sandy sits in the middle, and then me and my buddy and his girlfriend in the back seat. 
just about 10 minutes after the previews of the movie and all that kind of stuff, while you're getting your popcorn, your Coke and all that, Barbie says, I have some friends over here. I'll see y'all later. <sighs> I said, good grief. She got out of the car. I took Sandy home and I knew right then I wasn't going to take Sandy out again. So I asked my buddy, I said, do you have that girl Barbie's phone number that I can call her? He said, sure. I called her up, apologized for what happened. I said, I had nothing to do with that. I, I had nothing to do with that. Well, she didn't want to talk to me. I called again the next week. And finally, after a few phone calls, she said, okay, I'll, I got to ask my parents. This was back in those days, guys. You just didn't do it without your parents' approval. She asked her mom and dad, and she said, I didn't tell this in the first service, but, but she said, you've got to meet my mom and dad before they let me go out with you. <laughs> That's a piece of cake, you know? So I drive up to the house, which was just a few blocks from where I live in South Florida, had that rumbling 55 Chevy, and I'm thinking, I'm a hot stuff. Her dad comes to the door. He's about 230 pounds, all muscle, and he had an ugly look on his face, you know, like that. And I thought, oh, Lord, what am I in for now? He said, you David? I said, yes, sir. You taking my girl out? Yes, sir. Well, she'll be here in a minute. She came. We went out. That set up a few more dates. She liked my car. That's what it was. She liked my car. I don't think she cared much about me. After a while, we... Um, she was not impressed with me trying to impress her with taking her out to dinner and going to these restaurants. I was doing everything I could to impress this girl. For whatever reason, she just didn't seem to be all that impressed with me. And then one day she said to me, how would you like to come to church with me? <laughs> of course, I'll go to church with you, anything. During that summer of 1965, we had an evangelist. Back in those days, we had revivals for a week, sometimes two weeks. We had an evangelist from Louisiana. His name was Moody Adams. This guy was one of those hellfire kind of brimstone preachers, you know, with a Cajun accent. And, buddy, he let the hammer down. And I was already beginning to sense something that I didn't understand because Barbie was the kind of girl you couldn't mess with. Uh, you guys know what I'm talking about. I tried things with her she wouldn't let you lay a hand on her. That impressed me. So God began to work in my heart at that time. And I, my hands were off. I, I, I respected her. And during that week, during the preaching, starting on Sunday, he started preaching the word and I began to be so convicted of my life. I was disillusioned with my life. I didn't like where it was. I didn't like where I was going. I had no direction whatsoever. All I could hear was, you're a sinner. And I had to raise my hand and say, you're right about that. But then as the week went on, he said, but there is a Savior that can change everything. He can change your life. He can take away your fears. He can take away your lack of purpose in life. And he began to preach all of that stuff. And man, by the time Thursday came, I was, I was hooked. I knew that if I died, I'd go to hell. I knew there was a God in heaven. I knew that there was a person by the name of Jesus Christ that died on the cross and paid the price for everything I was experiencing. And I wanted that. I wanted to be forgiven. I, didn't, I was sick and tired of my life. But you know what? The devil was playing a trick on me. And he was saying in my mind, don't you dare go forward down that aisle. Don't you do that. If you do, you're going to lose this girl. Now, what kind of nonsense is that? On Thursday night, I couldn't take it anymore. Girl or no girl. My desire for salvation, my desire for new life, my desire for a new birth overwhelmed me. Do you all get that? Nod your head so I can, so, okay, you got it. I broke out down that aisle. And by the way, I was the pastor of this same church in 2011 where I was saved, where we were married, where I was called to preach. 
And Barbie and I got to be the pastor of that same church. But I broke down that aisle, fell on my knees at the altar, didn't even take the preacher's hand because I was absolutely broken over my sin. I knew I got, had to have help. And I, I was just crying. And I confessed and I prayed and I asked him. And God opened the eyes of my heart at that time. But here's the cool thing about it. The one that I thought I would lose, when I got to the place of gathering myself together and the preacher put his hand on my shoulder, guess who wrapped their arms around me? Guess. That girl. That girl. She's the one She's the one and it was during that summer that the army called and back in that time there was a little conflict going on in Southeast Asia called Vietnam a very unpopular war people tell me and they talk about Vietnam and they say oh you were in that unpopular war I'm going to tell you something those of us that were over there we were fighting for our country we weren't talking about politics it was life or death you fought for your country that you might stay alive and get home. Well, that's enough of that. I could go down that road a long way. But the army came and uh, Barbie and I were boyfriend and girlfriend. And while I was over in Germany, I'll, you said I had enough time. Do I have enough time? He nodded yes. While I was over in Germany, I was so in love. She was in love and I got a letter from her one day and she said, sweetheart, my mother uh, thinks that I should date a little more. What? She thinks I should date a little more. I'm getting too serious too quickly with you. Here I am in Europe, and she's in South Florida, and there's not a thing I can do. I was a young Christian, less than a year old, and I started going to the chaplain. I was reading and fortunately, I had a man in that church in Florida that mentored me through the mail. He would send me encouraging verses that I would learn and memorize. And so I went to God's word thinking that I might lose this girl of my dreams. Orders came for Vietnam, and I had a 30-day leave. I came home, and I called her, and I'm waiting for the answer. How'd this boyfriend thing go? All right? I hope y'all are, are as tense as I am right now. We go out on the date. And both of us know that this is going to come up. And finally, I said, uh, baby, how, how, how did that date go? You could have cut the air with a knife. And she turned to me with those beautiful brown eyes. And she said, well, I did go out on a date. But just a few minutes into the date... I turned to him and said, you can take me home now. There's only one for me. There's only one for me. And when she said that, I just kind of melted. I thought, wow. And I said, sweetheart, I love you so much. And she said, I love you too. And I said, would you marry me? Uh, sure did. I said, would you, would you marry me? She said, yes, I will. I said, let's go ask your parents. It was the next day. She had to be home at 10. Back in those days, you had a curfew. If you didn't have your girlfriend home and your parents, their parents told you that, you couldn't see them again. Nowadays, y'all stay out all night nearly, don't you? Mm. I took her home that night. The next day, I called, went over to meet her mom and dad. And... Uh, I had black rim glasses that day, and her dad was in the backyard putting something in the water filter. Well, we, Barbie and I decided we're going to ask him, and then he would talk to his wife, Barbie's mother. We go in the backyard, and I take my glasses off, getting up the nerve to ask him, can I marry your daughter? Now, I'm on a 30-day leave before going to Vietnam, 
And uh, she gets on the garbage can, sits there swinging her legs and puts my glasses on, looking like that. And I'm trying to get up enough nerve to ask her father, can I marry this girl? Finally, I did. And he said, uh, we'll talk about it. I said, I, don't, I didn't tell him this, but I thought, I only got 30 day leave here. Well, the next day, I went over there and he said, her mom and I have discussed this and we decided that you guys can get married when you get back from Vietnam. Not thinking about this, but at the time, he was probably thinking if you get back from Vietnam. We don't want you to marry now. She may become pregnant and have a child and we got to, I'm just telling you, that's what I was thinking later on. And I said, that's great. That's fine. I'll, I'm coming home. And I did. And uh, I came back from Vietnam in June of 1968. We were married on June 28th, 1968. Her mother and her sisters had planned the whole wedding. And there it is. That's my baby. That's a real good smooch, by the way. And uh, that was taken in the fellowship hall of the same church that I was saved in, the church that I pastored in 2011. And so a whole new life began for me. And then last January, my life turned on a dime. We, uh, we went off to college a year after our wedding and uh, been in the ministry all of our lives, have three children and what a ministry we've had. I pastored a little church here in Rangeville for many years, and Kevin and I have known one another since the time he came here. And I knew Jack Woods and some of the other pastors here, Nolan Ford and all of those guys were good buddies of mine It helped me when I came back to Alabama. And uh, y'all got time for me to tell you just a little bit more? Uh, just a little bit more. When I came, we got married, we came through here. I had five months to go in the military. In, in Fort Leonard Wood, and Barbie had never, she hadn't been out of Florida since she was 18. I mean, she raised in South Florida about a mile from the ocean. And I brought her through Alabama to meet my relatives, you know, and she was just blown away. And, and Sandra's grandmother, my aunt, uh, we spent the night right over here with her, and she just took Barbie in, and Barbie thought she had died and gone to heaven with all this Southern hospitality. She loved this place. She loved these people here. And we began, when we came back here in 1976 to live, Barbie adopted this place, and this place adopted her. But then that happened last year, and everything changed. I wasn't prepared. I should have been prepared. But as a pastor, I had done so many funerals, weddings. I never thought about my wife or me. I just thought she'd always be with me. And that's not too long ago. And um, it was the Lord's time. Now, let me get to the meat of what I want to share with you. There's a book that Alistair Begg, that you may have heard of the Scottish pastor in, in, in Ohio, wrote on Pray Big and like this sign right here. And he makes this comment about Ephesians chapter 1, verse 18. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be opened or enlightened. Alistair says this, when the eyes of our hearts are open to our future, it changes our lives now. It reorders our priorities and our prayers. We pray less about the practical details of life and first and foremost about the spiritual realities of our eternal life. Eternal matters matter more. The concerns of today less. We live out and pray based on the truth that to live is Christ and to die is gain. Now, let me tell you something, and I've just got a few more things to share with you. Satan does not want the eyes of your heart opened to the realities that God has for you. Do you understand that? You're cruising through life right now. A lot of y'all are young people. You have young children. Some of you aren't even married yet. You're sailing through life. But this passage says, 
as Paul prayed for the Ephesian church, that the eyes of their heart would be opened to the realities that are taking place around you. Let me remember this passage that I read just a moment ago. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them ever came to be. You're not a surprise to God. You're not an accident. God has a purpose. And God has a plan. And listen very carefully. It's so important that you open the eyes of your heart to the reality of spiritual things. Now, I want you to get that. Therein lies real joy, real happiness that the world can't give and the world cannot take it away. It's not in your career. It's not in your 401k. It's not in your home, your automobiles. It's in the person of Jesus Christ and the relationship with him. You don't have that. You close the eyes of your heart. You're just waffling through life. No purpose. Most of the time, no joy. John MacArthur says it like this. Physical suffering, mental anguish, disappointment, unfulfillment and failure squeeze the impurities out of a believer's life, making them pure channels through which God's power can work and flow. Now do you understand why Paul said this in 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 2? Here's what Paul said. That is why. For Christ's sake, I delight in weakness. I delight in insults. I delight in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. Listen to what he said. For when I am weak, then I'm strong. Because the strength doesn't come from us. It comes from him. Are you listening to that? Now, I'm old enough to tell you all this. Listen to me carefully. It works. You can bank on it. Brother Kevin will tell you, it works. Through every weakness, through every heartache, through every hardship, through every disappointment, it works. Since the Lord decided to take Barbie home, um, my life has now come into a different focus. And I'm beginning to realize there, I want to fulfill the purpose he has for me. And I was very reluctant to speak, even today, but the time has come. There was a man in the first century by the name of Aristides. And Aristides, he was a first century Greek, and he says this, he marveled at the extraordinary success of the new church, the Christianity that was just exploding in the first century. I mean, everywhere, everywhere Paul, churches were starting, people were, being sa people were having a new life. And this is what he said. This is a quote from Aristides. If any righteous man among the Christians passes from this world, they die. They rejoice, these Christians do, and they offer thanks to God. And they escort the body with songs of thanksgiving as if he were setting out from one place to another nearby. Well, is that so? Yes, that's so. The early Christians so affected the world at that time because they had a handle on death. Hmm. So, how do you develop that kind of faith that they had? You understand two words, and here they are. 
When I say you understand these two words, sometimes you have to take these two words by faith. Number one is providence. Providence. Providence is a fancy word for the fact that God is orchestrating and working things in your life and my life for his purpose and his will. You got that? The Bible is full of God's providence. It was God's providence that he knew someday I was going to accept him that he let me get in fistfights with different people in Illinois. It was God's providence during Vietnam when I had shrapnel going by my ear that I could hear it sing, 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 and I never got a scratch. That's providence. So, two words, providence and sovereignty. Sovereignty is that complete authority of God. Nothing gets by God without God saying, okay, have you ever read the book of Job? Who had to come to God to get permission? Huh? That's right. Did God put limits on Satan? He sure did. That's sovereignty. Now, I want you to get a handle on this because for me, when, Barbie took, when the Lord took Barbie, I had to back up. I did a lot of backtracking. And, and it, I had a lot of friends and a lot of pastors, Brother Kevin, so many people coming and offering. And I was at a place to where I had to back up and start rethinking everything I'd preached all my life. That's why now I don't preach like a preacher. I don't think. I hope I don't. I don't mean that in the wrong way. There's a more important purpose to my sharing with you today. So, how do you get to that place of having the kind of faith that the early church had? How do you get to the kind of place that you can deal with the death of a child, a death of a spouse? How do you get to that place? You got to understand providence and sovereignty. Here are a few verses that God brought back to me, and I'm going to try to wind on down here. Um, I have this habit, and I have had it all of my life as a pastor, that whatever crisis I was going through, I would uh, read some passages, and God would bring that verse out to me, and he would minister to me, and I would write down beside that verse a date. So all these years later, I've been able to go back through my Bibles, and I find, I find those dates, and I can remember just like that what was happening during that time, how God delivered me. God comforted me, and God challenged me. And so I began to go back through those, those passages, and I only list about three of them here, and let me give them to you real quick. The first one is in Psalm 31, verse 15, which says, my times are in your hands. I remember a time when that verse spoke to me, and, and God was saying, David, your time is in my hand. And I had to realize that Barbie's time was in God's hand as well. And another verse Psalm 139, verse 16b, all the days ordained for me, the psalmist says, were written in your book before one of them came to be. That's providence. All the days that you ordained for me are written in your book before the first day ever came to be. Now, I'm going through this quickly, but I want you to take these verses and sit down and ponder them in a while, muse over them. That's what I did. Psalm 138, verse 8. Another one that I had marked. The Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. Really? Yes. You see, God was putting these words in my heart for today because I didn't want to ever stand and preach again. I wanted to just crawl off somewhere and wallow in my tears. I wanted to lick my wounds. I wanted to remember that gal. She's back there too. You wonder where I'm pointing when I point back there. I wanted to remember that touch. I wanted to remember her kiss on my cheek. I wanted to remember the smell. I wanted to look at her jewelry that I brought her from around the world in my little, her little box. That's what I wanted to do. But God said, no. Her time came. Yours is not finished. You got something to do. And that's when Kevin 
spoke to me Saturday. And Kevin, that's exactly what God said to me. I'm not through yet. That's why I agreed to do that, by the way. You didn't twist my arm, did you? I don't think you did. So a couple more verses. One is in Psalm 32, 7, which says, and this gave me a lot of comfort. Psalm 32, 7, you are my hiding place. You will protect me from trouble and surround me with song del songs of deliverance. Now, with, with verses like that, how do you respond when all of a sudden everything's come crashing in? Uh, and you all have your own crashes. How do you deal with that? Life is so unsettling, and you've experienced this. You think you're prepared for that. There are three things that I want you to get a handle on. This is what I did. Let me put it this way. This is what I'm doing. Number one, I began to review God's faithfulness over my lifetime. I took time to back up and rethink my life and God's faithfulness to me. And I can't tell you how overwhelming that is. She and I experienced right at 50 years of marriage of God's faithfulness. And my soul was flooded. <sighs> Goodness, my soul was flooded with God's faithfulness. And I know and I understand what... I understand now Lamentations chapter 3. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness to me. Do y'all get that? When your world comes crashing down, let me challenge you. Back up. Make a list. If you're a list maker of God's faithfulness. That's what I did. That was the first thing I did. And it took me days, weeks, as a matter of fact. I reviewed his faithfulness. I reviewed, number two, his promises. Uh, and I don't have time to go all, all over all of the promises that he reminded me of. But the greatest promise that I remember reflecting upon was the resurrection. <laughs> Boy, did I ever reflect upon that. I've read every book I could get my hands on on heaven. I, I preached on heaven periodically. I don't think I ever preached a series on heaven. <clears throat> and I began to order everything of a good author that I trusted, and I began to read on that subject. And, and the second thing that I began to do, reviewing God's promises, a lot of it had to do was, was things like this. To live as Christ, to die is good. Today, you'll be with me in paradise. I went over and over and over. I began to think, well, what's it like in heaven? What is she doing now? I don't have time to tell you everything that I've been reading and that I believe, but I believe, let me give you an example. I don't think there are spirits just floating around up there trying to float on a cloud. I think that the experience that Peter, James, and John had with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. You remember that? And Moses and Elijah appeared to them. Nobody introduced Moses and Elijah. Did you know that? Somehow they knew who they were. But they weren't flesh and blood, but they were recognizable. Does that make sense? Jesus in his resurrected body, they could touch the scars, but he could just appear and disappear, couldn't he? He could go through a wall. I think that those that have died in Christ have some form, some form that's recognizable. I think the Bible lets us know there's a lot of singing and rejoicing going on right now. Well, I got to stop. I'll be here all day. I reviewed his promises. And I went back to a passage in Philippians 4 that says, Listen carefully. Philippians 4, 6, and 7. Do not be anxious about anything, David. But David, everything, even the death of Barbie, I want you to pray and petition 
with thanksgiving, and I want you to bring that request to me, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. And I'm going to tell you something, people. Here's the way I say it. Promise made, promise kept. Promise made, promise kept. The last thing I did was this. I reviewed God's plan for the rest of my life. Now, let me tell you something. It started the day that you were saved. Remember those passages in Psalm 138, Psalm 139? I began to review and I began to think, what is your plan for the rest of my life? I have three wonderful children. One of my daughters is here today, Joanna. Leah doesn't live right here. My kids are great kids. They all love the Lord. And uh, they have their lives. And I, I have a few days left, I guess, until my departure. And I want to make a difference. So here's something that I want to close with. These thoughts. Bear with me. and We're about finished. Thank you, Kevin, for giving me time. Y'all hear of Dr. Erwin Lutzer, Moody, past, used to be Pastor Moody Church. He wrote a little book that I read right away called One Minute After You Die. Now, you may disagree with Dr. Lutzer. That's your privilege. But after reading that, I began to research again, and, and I agree with him. So here's what he said. In the book, One Minute After You Die, he says, One Minute After You Die... Your death is just as meticulously planned as the death of Christ. Now listen carefully. Your death, my death, is just as meticulously planned as the death of Christ. He says this, there is no combination of evil men, disease, accident, that can kill us as long as God has work for us to do. Listen here. Here's the last sentence. To those who walk with faith in God's providence, they die according to God's timetable. That's why I can read this verse. Listen to this in light of that thought. Psalm 91, verses 1 through 7. He who dwells in the shelter of the Almighty, or the Most High, will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Surely He will save you from the fowler snare and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with His feathers. Under His wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and your rampart. You will not fear the terror of night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the plague that destroys at midday. A thousand may fall at your side, 10,000 at your right hand, but it will not come near you. How do you explain that? In Acts chapter 13, verse 36, Scripture says this. Speaking about King David, this is the last verse I'll share with you. David, after he had served the purpose of God in his own generation, fell asleep and was laid with his fathers. Now here's the key. David fulfilled the purpose that God had for him. In Acts chapter 13, it doesn't say anything about David's exploits as a king. All it says is he served the purpose of God in his generation and he died. That's what's going to happen to me. It happened to Barbie. It'll happen to you. If you are living in that vein of faith. Now you can take and do some foolish, stupid things and take yourself out of God's will. That's why he gives us free choice. I don't have time to get into all of that. Here's a thought that I want to leave with you. Randy Alcorn says in his book, Heaven, three people die every second. 180 people every minute. 
Nearly 11,000 people die every hour in which we've been talking. Now, if the Bible is right about what happens to us after death, and I believe it is, it means that more than 250,000 people die every day and they go to one place or the other. They go to heaven or to hell. I said this to the group Sunday night. When I was in Vietnam, we had a scope on our M16s called a starlight scope. Today, they're far more advanced than what we had, but it took the ambient light and magnified it so at night you could see the figures, not real good, but you could see the figures. And I thought of that the other night when Kevin asked me to speak. And have you ever watched falling stars? Huh? You ever see a falling star? There are over 250,000 people dying every day. And I had this thought. If we had eyes or a a scope like a starlight scope in the spiritual realm, we would see like shooting stars to heaven or to the place of doom. Going right now. Last thought. I'm going to close with this. What are you doing about that? What difference what I've shared with you, what difference does it make? Well, you're here because you must, if you're a Christian, you believe. You're here, and if you're not a Christian, God drew you here that you could hear something like this and know there's hope beyond the grave. That's why Paul could make that statement. There's no sting in death. There's no victory in the grave for those that trust in Christ. And I would ask you to make sure that you settle that issue. Make sure it's all done. And don't come to church just to come to church. Come to church that when they sing, you worship the king. I cry every Sunday. Every time she leads these songs and these people sing, I get lost. I don't even watch much. I get lost in the words of the writer of that song. That's what we're supposed to do. That's what worship is. Did you know that? When Kevin is preaching, my mind is going through the scriptures and his thoughts, and I'm engaging his mind as God gave him those words, and I'm in worship because we do not know what the next hour is going to hold. So you need to make the most of the days you have. Let's pray. Father, would you take this time, would you take these moments now, and I know you are, Lord, I don't even have to ask you, and penetrate our hearts with the truth of your word. Some people here need to rethink the purpose of their lives, how they're living their lives as Christians. Are they fulfilling the purpose to the best that they can for you? So they ask you every day they get up, Lord, guide me today to the people that I might speak on your, to on, on your behalf. Guide me with the influence that I have for my family and my friends. And especially, Lord, I pray for those that have never crossed that finish line of saying, yes, I want Christ as my Savior. I confess. I want him to be Lord. I am sick and tired of taking the risk of going to hell. This can be that time. And so I pray that decisions would be made this morning, Father, that would honor you. And I'll be thankful for that in Jesus' name. Amen.